a maritime dispute that could turn into a new flashpoint in the region. Between Southeast Asia's largest economy, Indonesia, and the world's second largest economy, China. Both are claiming sovereignty over waters off the resource-rich Natuna Islands. I think Indonesia has proven time and time again yeah, that they are a people who will be fighting to the death when it comes to territorial integrity issues. As far as China is concerned, all the islands, reefs and islets in the South China Sea are within the Chinese sovereign rights. China claims that it has historic rights to most parts of the waters of Natuna. For Indonesia, the Natuna Sea falls within 200 nautical miles of its coastline, making it part of its exclusive economic zone, or EEZ. Whether you like it or not, Indonesia now has become a claimant state in terms of the EEZ, because part of the EEZ has been claimed by Beijing, and Indonesia refused to acknowledge this. Can Indonesia afford to set limits to China's maritime ambition in the South China Sea? And given its dependence on China for investments and trade, will it stand to gain or lose from its maritime dispute with the global superpower? Indra has been a fisherman all of his life, just like his father and many other islanders in the Natuna. It's a sparsely populated archipelago of 154 islands, situated more than 1,000 kilometers north of the Indonesian capital, Jakarta. The 40-year-old father of four, Indra spends almost every day out at sea to earn an income for his family. It's a tough job that requires patience and great stamina. But this is the only profession he knows best. Sea fishing carries with it a lot of risks. The waters around Natuna, for example, are often rough and unpredictable. The waves can reach up to eight meters, especially during the monsoon season. In spite of all the risks and the harsh working conditions, he still feels a strong attachment to the sea. Indra earns around 7 million rupiah or 486 US dollars for a long fishing trip. On a good day, his total catch could go up to 200 kilograms of fish. His catch is usually sold to retailers around the country and also to neighboring Singapore and the money he earns in a month is just enough to cover his daily expenses and send his children to school. But recently, he's become deeply worried about the presence of foreign fishing vessels, mainly from Vietnam, Thailand and China. It's an intimidating sight for many local fishermen who rely on their small wooden boats to fish. It's Indra 
illegal fishing is estimated to cost Indonesia around 3 billion US dollars a year. Indra says these foreign fishing trawlers would often extract huge quantities of fish from the ocean, destroying corals in the process and reducing fish population. These fast and modern foreign vessels are often 10 times bigger than ordinary wooden boats used by Indonesian fishermen. And many can only watch helplessly as large quantities of fish are being taken out from the ocean. Harapan saya sih, buka namanya buka harimau tuh yang tak ramah lingkungan tuh jangan diadakan lah di Natuna nih. Karena kami mikir anak cucu kami bu, karena di laut di laut Natuna nih kan masih kayaknya lautnya masih anu lah banyak ada ikan lah kan. Nah, kalau udah masuk kapal-kapal asing nggak gitu, pokoknya kami tak bisa lagi lah melaut lepas sana. Balik tekur, balik tekur, ya kan? Jadi anak cucu kami mau makan apa nanti kalau udah masuk kapal-kapal itu di laut Natuna nih? The same sentiment is also shared by 34-year-old fisherman Rahmat Wijaya. He feels that the presence of these larger fishing vessels from Vietnam, Thailand, and China inside Indonesia's exclusive economic zone has forced local fishermen to compete for the ocean's resources. Jadi kita berebutan sport fishing, tapi ya namanya kita tradisional kan, terpaksalah kita biasanya mengalah bu, kita menjauh biasanya. Karena kita pun tak mau ada benturan kan, karena macam mana pun kita dengan armada yang lebih kecil ya riskan juga, lebih berisiko. Kalau mereka sih main labrak-labrak aja, kalau memang mau ke situ ya ke situ, biarpun ada kita nggak mau tahu dia. Kalau kita lebih baik, lebih ini, lebih sering menghindar, nggak ter terlalu mau dekat lah. Mereka jauh masuk bu, jauh masuk ke wilayah Indonesia bu. China says the waters around the resource-rich Natuna Islands are the country's traditional fishing grounds. It therefore regards the waters around these islands as part of their own territory based on its so-called Nine Dash Line adopted by Chinese maps in the 1940s. It means that the ocean, islands or reefs that fall within that line belong to China. And that essentially encompasses almost all of the South China Sea. But the area also overlaps with Indonesia's 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone or EEZ. The first major encounter between the Indonesian Navy and Chinese fishing vessels occurred in 2016. Since then, there have been more than 10 times that Chinese vessels were seen to have entered into Indonesia's exclusive economic zones. Indonesia responded by increasing patrols around the region. It also deployed Navy vessels to the region, assisted by air patrol in a bid to secure the area and more importantly, underline Indonesia's sovereignty over these waters. First and foremost, a part of the Natuna Islands lies in what we call almost the central position within the South China Sea. Now, this is a maritime space that um, China considers to be its rightful place through historical claims. But if you look at the Natuna Islands from an Indonesian perspective, I think it is an inalienable part of Indonesian territory. So for me, as an area studies scholar, the Natuna Islands is integral to Indonesia's territoriality and sovereignty. So uh, we have to understand that Indonesia was never a claimant to the South China Sea disputes. Yeah? However, in recent years, uh, China has been deploying large assets, military assets, coast guards assets uh, into waters claimed by Jakarta as part of its exclusive economic zone yeah, or the EEZ. Given this uh, China's recent actions in the South China Sea, Jakarta has been rapidly hardening the island with military installations. So these installations include a uh, submarine building facility, uh, piers that can hold larger warships, such as amphibious assault ships and frigates, uh, and also bases for military aircraft, such as the Sukhois and the Apache helicopters. So I think over the last five years, I've not seen an island in Southeast Asia that has been militarized as rapidly as the Natuna Islands. 
President Joko Widodo has made several visits to Natuna to reassert Indonesia's authority and sovereignty over the territory. But China is not giving up. Just last year, China asked Indonesia to stop drilling for oil and natural gas in maritime territory claimed by both countries. For a few months, Chinese and Indonesian ships shadowed each other around the oil and gas field, frequently coming within one nautical mile of each other. But Indonesia seems to have ignored Beijing's diplomatic note. Diplomatic notes regarding uh, South China Sea, the matters have been sent by Beijing to uh, Jakarta uh, quite often. So uh, I remember that uh, in 2017, 2017, when Jakarta renamed part of the South China Sea the water um, as Laut Natuna Utara, China, in fact, sent diplomatic notes, you know, uh, protesting about the chains, uh, and then saying that it was a senders, you know, uh, things to do and so forth. Nevertheless, Indonesia continued to use the name, which is the North Natuna Sea, you know, because Indonesia feel that it belongs to Indonesia, that Indonesia got the right to give its own name. But the, after receiving the diplomatic notes, the drillings continue. The issue of territorial sovereignty is a core interest of every country in the world, so as China. Well, China's claim in the South China Sea um, is comprised of those two parts, territorial sovereignty and maritime rights and interest claims in the South China Sea. Therefore, um, to China, the importance lies in both the territorial, territorial sovereignty thing and also to the maritime interests, including the rights and interests of exploring the maritime resources, the natural resources, including the fishing resources and the uh, natural oil and gas resources. Beijing has embarked on massive reclamation projects in the South China Sea turning rocky outcrops into man-made islands that angers other claimant states. Former Chinese diplomat Victor Cao says China's claim in the South China Sea is undisputed. If we look at the historical records, back in 1945, when Japan unconditionally surrendered, in the region surrounding the South China Sea, China was the only sovereign state standing on its feet. Vietnam at that time was not a sovereign country. It was a colony of France. The Philippines was a colony of the United States occupied by Japan. Indonesia was not a sovereign independent country. It was a colony of the Netherlands. Malaysia was occupied by the British. Therefore, when China reclaimed all the islands and isles and reefs in the South China Sea from Japan, literally, there, at that time, there was no independent Malaysia, no independent Vietnam, no independent the Philippines, no independent uh, Indonesia, you name it. China, back in 1945, was the only sovereign independent country in this part of the world, standing on its feet, defeating imperialist Japan, reclaiming all the territories in the South China Sea. By which time, um, you know, uh, Indonesia was well on the road to sovereignty because it was going through its revolutionary wars from 1945 to 49. So the same revolutionary war that Indonesia was going through against the Dutch, the Chinese were going through a civil war. So how does it make their claims any different from the claims of the other states? So this is where, for me, the convention on the law of the seas becomes important because the emergence of independent nation states in the region and how you manage the relations among these nations determines that there has to be a law in place that will therefore address conflicts in that region. Both China and Indonesia have kept details of the latest spats under wraps. But the incident has exposed the delicate relations between the two countries. But what is life like 
for ordinary people in Natuna. Are they aware of the diplomatic tensions right on their doorstep? It's a typical late afternoon in Natuna Bursar, the largest island that makes up Natuna archipelago. Fishermen are unloading their last batch of fish they caught in the morning. The day is almost over, and yet the fish market here is still abuzz with activity. As the sun descends from its daytime peak, the islanders take the opportunity to go for a swim in the sea, exercise in the park, or simply eat out by the seaside with their family and friends. 25-year-old postgraduate university student Destriyadi Nuryadin feels that life for many islanders have improved in the past few years. There's now a greater interest on the part of the authorities to develop the remote island and boost its reputation. Perubahannya aku lihat dari kecil sampai sekarang banyak tempat-tempat jajanan yang lebih banyak itu serius lebih banyak mungkin ekonomisnya lebih tinggi ya fasilitas-fasilitas yang ada terus arena ruang publik seperti pantai piwang itu mulai dibangun artian memberikan ruang yang lebih nyaman untuk masyarakat itu sendiri. More roads, schools, and other public facilities have also been built here in Natuna Bursar. Blessed with pristine beaches and unique rock formation, the area is also being developed into an international tourist destination. Destriyadi is currently studying Indonesian language at the Gajah Mada University in Yogyakarta, Java. He's here in Natuna to conduct research on its local culture and oral traditions. Just like Destriyadi, Wan Siswandi is also born and raised here in Natuna. Being a local boy, he has all the information about the surrounding islands at his fingertips. The 53-year-old father of five was elected regent in 2021. His role has now become more significant in view of increasing activities of foreign fishing vessels in waters around the Natuna. Tapi yang paling penting itu di samping letaknya langsung berbatasan dengan, dengan negara. Ini di Laut Cina Selatan ini, yang berbatasan dengan Cina, dengan Vietnam, dengan mana-mana itu, itu ada sumber gas yang terbesar cadangan di dunia malah itu. Minyak juga demikian yang kita dapat informasi dari kementerian terkait lah. Jadi kalau tidak dijaga itu Natuna ini bahaya. Jadi karena apa? Karena nanti eh, apa aset-aset potensi kita bisa diserobot orang. Jadi gas-gas Singapura itu ya juga ada Natuna itu. Dan sekarang ini juga baru-baru ini juga ada sudah ada pengeboran baru, rig baru, juga sudah ditemukan minyaknya. Sudah sudah berlangsung itu. There are around 86,000 people who live on the sparsely populated archipelago. More than half are fishermen, while others are farmers as well as traders. Life seems idyllic in Natuna but it disguises simmering tensions between Indonesia and China following the incursions of Chinese fishing vessels into these waters. The government has reiterated its commitment to boost development in the resource-rich Natuna Islands to assert its sovereignty. It has also bolstered its military presence on Natuna Bursar, the largest island in the area, and held military exercises in the surrounding waters. itu yang terbesar, jadi sehingga Bapak Presiden itu mencanangkan Natuna ini dijadikan daerah pertahanan, kemudian juga dijadikan daerah perusata, terus juga daerah perikanan, kemudian migas itu sendiri, kemudian baru uh, lingkungan hidup. Nah, kenapa memang Bapak Presiden mencanangkan begitu? Karena memang tentunya Tujuan yang pertama itu adalah untuk penguatan pengamanan di Laut Natuna. Kalau dulu kan Laut Cina Selatan, sekarang kan Laut Natuna Utara ini. Nah, agar aset kita yang di laut itu e, bisa diamankan lah. Tentunya juga dengan penguatan-penguatan e, dari TNI. 
But the government also wants to present the softer side of the islands, especially their natural beauty, in a bid to attract tourists to these islands. The government is nominating Natuna as a UNESCO Global Geopark because of its biodiversity and unique geological features. Nah, tujuannya adalah memang bicara wisata agar orang mengenal Natuna ini tidak dari sisi namanya Natuna. Kau Natuna itu kan ada udang Natuna, kakap Natuna itu kan minyak itu. Offshore dari sebelum Kabupaten Natuna, orang sudah tahu Natuna, internasional sudah tahu. Nah, tapi juga kita tidak mau orang mengenal Natuna hanya sekedar dari daerah pertahanan. Tapi kita kepingin Natuna juga dikenal daerah persatanya. The presence of Indonesia's Navy and Coast Guard around Natuna Islands has served as a deterrent against potential intruders for now. But the islanders feel the government should do more. Yang yang paling berdampak gimana di di lautnya mereka sendiri, laut yang mereka setiap hari mereka apa ya selami gitu. Uh, diusir oleh tamu gitu. Jadi ketika pompong mereka yang ukuran kecil itu berhadapan dengan kapal-kapal besar itu, yang mereka diusir gitu. Jadi kan mereka tidak tidak bebas lagi untuk mencari ikan di, di lautnya mereka sendiri gitu. Ya sebenarnya kan negara itu punya konsep pertahanan tersendiri terhadap laut ini bu. Mereka lah yang seharusnya di depan untuk mempertahankan kedaulatan sumber daya laut kita gitu. Baik dari gangguan kapal-kapal ikan asing maupun e, pengamanan dan gangguan dari kapal-kapal ikan nasional yang menggunakan alat-alat tangkap yang merusak lingkungan gitu. Nah negara seharusnya hadir di sana gitu. Apa daya masyarakat berbuat kalau negara tidak mau hadir e, melindungi potensi sumber daya ini gitu. Seharusnya negara lebih mengutamakan keberlanjutan ekonomi masyarakat-masyarakat lokal, masyarakat-masyarakat nelayan yang ada di suatu kawasan itu. Indra is one of more than 50,000 fishermen in Natuna. His wife, Maya Angela, a 33-year-old mother of four, is constantly worried about the safety of her husband because of the potential harm these bigger foreign fishing vessels might pose to local fishermen fishing in Atuna's waters. Saya pernah kadang-kadang itu memang setiap tahun tuh kadang sering dengar orang tuh jumpa. Kemarin bapak pun sering jumpa juga jumpa kapal asing itu. Tapi gimana lah ya? Untuk itu was-was juga lah ya. Takut mana tahu kan nasib nggak baik pas pergi sendiri. Tapi alhamdulillah jarang juga kalau pas ngelaut tuh memang berdua jarang sendiri dia. Apalagi eh, memang fokus ke laut kan pas nggak ada ikan lagi susah kemarin kan. Nah, kita pun kalau menyangkut, menyangkut ekonomi ini agak ini juga agak was was juga kan. Kalau nggak ada ikan lagi gimana suami kita? Mau cari ikan, gitu. Mudah-mudahan lah nggak ini lagi kan. Despite the territorial disputes between Indonesia and China, life goes on in the two islands. But it's not likely that the problem will go away. Indonesia needs China to develop the country's infrastructure and boost trade between the two countries. Can Indonesia afford to act tough? given China's heavy influence in its economy. March 2022. At a site deep within the jungle of East Kalimantan province, President Joko Widodo officially launched the construction of Indonesia's new capital, Nusantara. 34 governors from across the country and a number of cabinet ministers joined the ceremony on Borneo Island. More than 1,200 kilometers from the current capital, Jakarta. Mudah-mudahan tetap berdoa semoga hidayah dan barokah dari Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala memberikan kemudahan dan kelancaran kita dalam membangun ibu kota Nusantara ini. Nusantara, which literally means archipelago, 
represents President Jokowi's most ambitious infrastructure project to date. The government wants the new capital to promote growth beyond Java Island and ease pressure on the megacity of 10 million people. Jakarta today suffers from chronic congestion, frequent floods and air pollution. The city is also sinking rapidly. The massive project is estimated to cost a whopping 467 trillion rupiah or 32 billion US dollars and it could take up to 20 years to complete. Analysts expect Chinese investors to fill the funding gap. On the 16th of March, the President Xi Jinping telephoned President Jokowi expressing the desire for China uh, to continue to work with Indonesia in the economic field, in the vaccine cooperation, so, and also in supporting Indonesian uh, suggestions uh, as the president of G20. Now, this is quite significant a, a development. It, I think it shows that, that, that um, China, in fact, wanted to be friendly with Indonesia. Jokowi wanted China to help in the development of the new capital in Kalimantan. And this will make Indonesian-China economic relation tighter, if that happened. China is also Indonesia's biggest trading partner and investor under the Belt and Road Initiative. Launched in 2013 by President Xi Jinping, the infrastructure initiative aims to connect more than 70 countries across Asia, Europe and Asia via a network of railways, highways and ports. And the BRI strikes a chord with Jokowi. After all, it's in line with his 2014 election campaign promise to overhaul and upgrade the country's woeful infrastructure. At least four provinces outside Java have been designated as project locations under the BRI. And the injection of foreign capital is necessary to help finance President Jokowi's infrastructure push. But the territorial dispute over the waters of the Natuna Islands has now threatened to jeopardize ties between the two countries. I mean, to be honest, Indonesia can continue to develop, to develop its infrastructure without BRI, without China. But there would be significant cuts in projects outside Java, including Jokowi's pet project of building a new capital in the middle of a Borneo jungle. Without BRI, Indonesia will fall back to its old Java-centric template of focusing on the main island. And now you see non-Chinese investors are present in this main island, Java including in development of roads, ports, and energy projects. Western and, Javan and Japanese investors beyond oil and mining, they are reluctant to invest outside Java because that will, bear, that will bring more costs on logistics, on licensing issues, and also on construction processes. So if China did not step in to build Indonesia's like first bullet train system in West Java, the Japanese would have been more than happy to do it. The Japanese wanted that project badly, but lost to China, who successfully convinced Jokowi in 2015. So Indonesia can definitely build without China, but should they? I think that in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative, Indonesia is indeed a very important country. If we look back 2013, it is just in Jakarta when uh, President Xi Jinping visited Jakarta, visited uh, Indonesia, when he proposed the, uh, the Bell and Road Initiative. It is just in Jakarta. So it's a very important country. And also uh, this, uh, is, it is exactly that year, 2013, that China and Indonesia becoming the, uh, the comprehensive strategic partnership uh, relationship.
Um, and also the, uh, uh, the, the president of, uh, of, of Indonesia proposed this uh, uh, global, global ocean fulcrum, which China also sees uh, is, uh, and supports uh, the, uh, the, uh, the this um, ocean, ocean ocean strategy, and we think that maybe we can work together um, both the uh, global maritime global ocean fulcrum and the Bell and Road Initiative. Maybe there are something that we can work together to uh, to establish both of us as maritime states. Indonesia has offered 28 projects worth 91.1 billion U.S. dollars to Chinese developers. The projects include seaports and industrial estates, power plants, smelters, and tourism estates. Chinese-funded projects include the railway linking Jakarta with West Java's capital of Bandung, which is scheduled for completion in 2023. Since 2013, Chinese companies have invested at least 12 billion US dollars into steel and nickel projects. China is also one of Indonesia's biggest trading partners since 2013. So, given Indonesia's deep economic links with China for many of its critical infrastructural projects, can it afford to take an aggressive stance against China in dealing with the Natuna Islands dispute? When it comes to the South China Sea dispute, uh, Indonesia is in a very unique position, uh, a dilemma if you will. Because Indonesia, uh, between Indonesia and China, I think the amount of trade that goes on between the two countries is very significant. I think China is still one of Indonesia's biggest trading partners. Uh, and in addition to that, Indonesia has been increasingly importing Chinese weapons. You are seeing a lot more Chinese weapons being deployed across various units of the Indonesian armed forces today uh, than you did 10 years ago. This include anti-aircraft guns, uh, anti-ship missiles, uh, vessel combat management systems, and the list goes on. So it's a very unique dilemma in which uh, a lot of uh, the Indonesian armed forces uh, requirements are being fulfilled uh, by Chinese contractors. And like any other country with strategic intelligence capacity, China views each country in Southeast Asia differently. Indonesia is viewed as Southeast Asia's biggest economy by far, with the largest market for Chinese products, the largest natural resource producer for Chinese industries, and the largest space for infrastructure development that answers China's overproduction issues. At the same time, Indonesia has a stable political environment despite its very active democracy. The Chinese-funded Jakarta-Bandung high-speed railway link project is a testimony to the close relations between leaders of the two countries. The 142-kilometer rail line is scheduled for completion next year after delays caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and technical glitches. Ini project yang sangat penting, yang di mana kedua pimpinan negara, Presiden Joko Widodo dan juga Presiden Xi Jinping. Uh, sangat intens ya uh, memonitor dan memastikan keberhasilannya uh, beberapa, beberapa kali mereka teleponan selalu uh, diskusi terkait uh, kereta cepat uh, Jakarta Bandung karena ini penting untuk membuktikan kepada dunia uh, bahwa uh, Indonesia dan juga uh, China dapat berkolaborasi uh, dengan baik dan uh, membangun uh, sesuatu infrastruktur fasilitas uh, publik yang nantinya dapat bermanfaat bagi ekonomi Indonesia maupun uh, China dan juga uh, bermanfaat bagi uh, masyarakat. But in spite of their close ties, does that necessarily mean that Indonesia will bow to China's pressure and give up its maritime claims in waters surrounding the Natuna Islands? In the Xi Jinping telephone conversation with Jokowi. Xi Jinping says that, let us, these two major countries, two big countries, you know, cooperate and develop together. <laughs> yeah. Of course, if China want, uh, wanted to have part of the Indonesian uh, territory as Chinese uh, territory, 
I do not think that it will be tolerated by Indonesia. But what impact will that have on the current economic cooperation between China and Indonesia? Will the territorial dispute undermine the close economic ties between the two countries? Batam Island, a small but busy island in the Riau archipelago, just 20 kilometers off the Singapore southern coast. Here, impounded foreign ships have become quite a common sight these days. They're kept and secured to the docks by the Marine and Fisheries Resources Authorities in Batam. The detained crew members of these vessels are now awaiting trial for alleged illegal fishing in Indonesian waters, a serious offence under the Indonesian law. This is a barang bukti yang disita dari kapal-kapal yang ditangkap kapal yang melakukan illegal fishing. Ini adalah barang bukti berupa jaring troll. Nah ini jaring yang merusak ekosistem di perairan ini. Nah ini. Ini kuat sekali ini bisa menghancurkan karang-karang ini. Nah ini adalah satu unit, satu unit jaring troll. The crew members could wait for up to 30 days before the actual trial begins. If found guilty, they can be jailed up to six years under Indonesia's shipping law or fined up to 41,000 US dollars. And these impounded foreign vessels will be used as material evidence to charge those involved in the alleged offences. Ini adalah dermaga tempat uh, sadarnya kapal-kapal yang diamankan. Ini adalah kapal uh, yang melakukan illegal fishing kanan kiri ini. Uh, ini adalah yang melakukan kegiatan penangkapan il ilegal yang ada di Laut Natuna Utara. Jadi di ad hoc ke sini untuk dilakukan penyidikan lebih lanjut. There are however no signs of Chinese fishing boats or their crew members in the facility here in Batam Island. But the fact is, there have been numerous cases of foreign vessels being impounded or turned away from the Indonesian waters of late due to increasing patrols by the Indonesian authorities around the disputed region. Illegal fishing activities were at an all-time high between December 2019 and January 2020. That was when nearly 60 Chinese vessels were found to have crossed into Indonesia's exclusive economic zone, or EEZ. Indonesia is not a claimant state in the South China Sea dispute, but the two countries have been embroiled in a diplomatic tug of war over the EEZ, which partially falls within China's so-called Nine Dash Line. It's the vague boundary used by China to lay claim to about 90% of the South China Sea. To defend the territorial in integrity, I think, is a serious matter. I think, as far as, although Indonesian military capability, I think it's not very effective yet. I do not think that Indonesia would give up last year, August, for instance. There was the largest joint military exercise between Indonesia and the United States, involving 4,500 personnel and soldiers. You see. And then also Air Force and other forces. I think it's very significant in, in terms of the security policy in Indonesia. Uh, it is argued that that exercise, in fact, is also linked to the defense of uh, Natuna waters. Even if the South China Sea claimants were to combine all their military assets together and fight as a unified force against China, it will pale in comparison. Uh, China's military modernization uh, over the past 10 years has been very remarkable. It cannot compare uh, with any of those uh, the, the claimants to the South China Sea disputes. That's the difference Indonesia has over the, the rest of the countries. Uh, Indonesia itself has been rapidly uh, militarizing its forces uh, over the past 10 years with this plan known as the Minimum Essential Force. Uh, you will see there is a lot more uh, surface combatants. Uh, they have improved 
uh, the capabilities of their submarine fleet. And I think this is uh, the, the only uh, Southeast Asian country uh, outside Singapore that can mount uh, a serious challenge to uh, Beijing's military might in the South China Sea. But the use of force is never a preferred option by claimant states in the region as a means of settling the dispute. For Indonesia at least, the show of military force merely serves as a deterrent effect against threats to its maritime sovereignty and territorial integrity. So when the chips are down, if the, national in, uh, if the territorial integrity of Indonesia is under threat, then the government would react. If the government did not react, if the government did not, the Indonesian military will act. Because Indonesian military, of course, is a force which is supposed to defend the country boundaries and territory. It is a public I think, knowledge that there is some division between the military I think, and the foreign ministry, for instance. And especially defense ministry under Prabowo Subianto. So I think it seems to me that the defense uh, of the EEZ, I think, uh, is uh, an important issue here. And then I do not think that uh, China uh, would, at this particular moment, would push you know, too much. Yeah, so that um, it would make Indonesia react, you know, uh, rather unfriendly. The reality is Indonesia has become increasingly wary over Beijing's intentions. So if it does act tough against the incursions of Chinese vessels into its territorial waters, there's concern that the Scarborough Shoals incident may well repeat itself. The shoal, which is located 120 nautical miles inside the Philippines' exclusive economic zone, has since come under Chinese de facto control following a standoff with the Philippines Coast Guards in 2012. When Scarborough Shoal was taken over by the Chinese, uh, it came against the backdrop of a very weak uh, Philippine military presence in the region. Um, you know, the Chinese sort of effectively strolled in into the island uh, with very little resistance from the Philippines, and understandably so, because Manila is not able to mount a military challenge against Beijing. So the same thing will not happen to Indonesia today because Indonesia, like I said, is able to punch back given the, the number of military assets that it has deployed to the region. And I think Beijing understands if it tries to do uh, what it did against Scarborough Shoal in the Philippines, uh, against Indonesia, it's going to be suffering from a very big black eye. The territorial dispute puts into question the role of the region's largest grouping, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN. ASEAN has been pushing for the establishment of a code of conduct with Beijing to try and settle the dispute once and for all. But in spite of all their good intentions and recent promises, it's still struggling to bridge fundamentally divergent interests of all parties in the South China Sea dispute. Yes, I think, as all of us know, ASEAN, in fact, is not a homogeneous group. It's not united. Nevertheless, it is a common interest, I think, to have ASEAN viable. Because if you want to have, uh, to have a role to play, if you want to make the region a stable and peaceful one, then ASEAN had to get united. This is a big challenge for the ASEAN states. As far as Indonesia is concerned, the country's reliance on Chinese investments and trade has put Jakarta in a rather difficult position, especially when the issue of national pride comes into play. In spite of Indonesia's reliance on China for trade and infrastructure developments, it's not prepared to sacrifice its own territorial integrity. Other than military confrontation, diplomacy and cooperation seem to be the only way forward to resolving the crisis. 
So the option that both countries are looking at now is how to manage movements over the waters through some sort of cooperation. Now, this can be stretched to a joint development of the deep sea gas resources without fussing about border lines. Indonesia is still far from actively developing the Natuna gas deposit, and Indonesia still needs better technology to detect those hydrocarbon mother loads. We need to understand that the nine dash line, a uh, part of it cuts into Indonesia's claim for an exclusive economic zone. It's very unlikely that both countries will back down uh, from their respective claims. So until uh, we see a way out, you know, in the, the code of conduct, perhaps uh, there might be a way out. But for these claims, I don't think there ever will be a solution because either countries uh, will not recognize each other's construct uh, in that part of the world. I think when we involve in any kind of territorial dispute, diplomacy is the best choice. War is the last resort and will not be the first preferred choice at all. And war is, is easy to launch, but is very difficult to end. And I think we need to really consider the situation, not only for the current generation, but for hundreds of generations to come. And I would say long-standing, sustainable friendship and goodwill between China and Indonesia will be a huge pillar for stability and growth in the South China region and involving uh, all corners of the South China Sea. And I think this is the best choice for China as well as for Indonesia. While diplomacy seems to be the best way to moderate China's growing assertiveness, it remains unclear for now if the strategy will achieve its objective, especially when territorial ambition comes into conflict with the country's national pride.